All right, guys, let's do this. What up? It's JoJo on the radio. This is the iHeartRadio Countdown, and uh, I am, I'm so pumped to see this guy. I've known this guy for a minute. Louis Tomlinson, sir. How, how, how you been? How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing awesome. you got to be uh, pumped because uh, you. how long have you been working on on this album? I mean, went from start to now, it's got to I mean... Just... Um, so I went on tour in February, and I'd pretty much done the album by then. So I want to say... I mean, it's probably coming up to two years now in terms of how long I've had this record. Um, I started it about halfway through lockdown. Uh, first half, deliberately did absolutely nothing, enjoyed putting my feet up. And then the second half, I started writing. So probably at least 18 months I've had it. All right, we got lots to chat with Louis, of course. Music, life, tour, which is uh, details on that coming up. Tattoos, I'll get into that later on. Before we talk uh, all this stuff, Louis, uh, fans are going to ask me in the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. How are you doing i mean before you go on this run which is going to be completely exhausting like athletically mentally f spiritually it, are you how are you i'm doing good i'm doing really good this is an exciting time obviously as i said before you know i've had this record for such a long time now this is the good part getting to kind of you know gauge the reaction of, of different fans on different songs like the reaction on the first single which has been incredible so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing good. I'm a little bit tired, but other than that, I'm all right. <laughs> well, that's, well, get, get re fans are going to tell me to say this. Get plenty of rest. We need you in good. I'm spirits, trying. Good shape. I'm trying. All right. <laughs> hey, we, we were talking off, uh, off air a moment ago about how the, like you said at one point, um, your personal taste in music and your fans' personal taste mm. in music. It seems to be coming to like uh, where you guys almost have a similar, you know, vibe. I guess I mm. forget how you worded it, but uh, tell me what you said, and then I'll follow up the question on that. Yeah, I think um, I think you know I've always liked the type of music that that, that I like, um, but I don't think there was definitely a time where I'd started my solo career and I and I realised that I had to embrace those kind of loves um, in terms of you know specifics of what kind of genre I listen to and then obviously what kind of genre I want to make. But what's been amazing for me and it kind of come to a head at, at my festival that I just did, uh, which I. I, I cur curated myself and we ha we created the full lineup. And um, watching my fans' reaction to some of the bands that we played there was really, really interesting because I think maybe at the start of the Walls process or at the start of my solo career, at least I didn't get a sense that me and the fan base as a whole had super similar musical interests. Whereas as time's gone on, I can feel that gap getting smaller and smaller. And that was definitely the case when I was out watching my festival. I've got this, like, um, I had this amazing band called Stone. And they're, like, they're pretty punk. Um, and a far cry from the type of music I make. But watching their initial reaction when they first came out, the fans, I mean, like, they were not so sure. And then by the end, like, everyone was moving and jumping and loving it. So that's an amazing feeling for me, definitely. Now, do you think you are... And here's the question I was leading to. Do you think you are shaping your fans' taste a bit, or do you think they're shaping yours in a way? I mean, I guess with the with the with the uh, the theory of you know at your festival, maybe you're shaping theirs a bit because you're introducing them to these bands. Yeah, I'm pretty. I am pretty judgmental when it comes down to music. I try not to be, but I am. Um, I, I, <laughs> maybe 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 I'm shaping theirs, or maybe I'm just kind of introducing them to something that. You know, they were always going to love. It's just kind of me who's kind of put it on their lap and, and, and showed them that side of the industry. Louis, uh, Faith in the Future. This album, I mean, talk about the album. Uh, g give me your an overall statement on what people, you know, should expect from this, this project. I, d I, I do think that anyone who's heard my first album, this does feel like a shift. It does feel like a, a distinct difference. Uh, there's definitely a couple of songs on there that kind of marry up the two albums. But for me, the, the two most important things to come out of this record was, A, that it's going to stand up at the live show, which I'm confident it's going to. So every song stands the test in your head of, we'll go over great live. Yeah, I mean, that every single song that I wrote, not just the songs that made the record, every single song I wrote with the live show in mind. Um it's massively important to me. And also, you know, those moments are arguably the best moments in music. Those We've all got our own kind of individual memories of being at live music. Right. Um, so it's kind of just centering around that energy and that kind of atmosphere. And then secondly, I just want it to feel hopeful. I want it to like be full of hope and excitement as opposed to like kind of wait emotionally. Yeah, and the, the, 
the album, the title, Faith in the Future. I love that title so much. And I'll tell you how much I love it. You already know, but I'll tell you how much I love it later on in the count. How many how many tracks did you record? Because I'm, I'm assuming you recorded quite a few to whittle down to, you know, the yes, final. So I want to say I, I maybe I wrote less for this record than I did in the first record just because I was a lot, I had a lot more clarity. I knew what I wanted to do on this record. But still, I probably wrote maybe 40 songs, maybe recorded. 25 and then what is it 16 17 made the record and these tracks just stay on a a hard drive somewhere and they may see the light of day at some point or not every now and then like normally after making an album like there might be two or three months where i listen back to some of those um songs and 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 rate them but actually as time goes on it's funny like that or at least how i interpret my creating and songwriting it does feel like a moment in time so even in a year's time when i listen back to those songs they will not. They won't feel old, but it will feel like the past. Right. For example, I can hear. A, I, like I'll hear clips of myself on the radio, different thing, but similar. And I can hear it the next day and go, "Man, that sounds like yesterday." It's yeah. just such a. I don't know. Maybe I'm just over. I overthink everything. Just so you know. <laughs> uh, the title track, "Faith in the Future." Uh, there is no track with this name. So give me some thoughts, some backstory on just you know. Once again, "Faith in the Future." Well, for a start, for a start. Um, I actually tried twice on this album. I tried tr- I tried twice to... Uh, so I, the, the title came first before I'd written any of the songs. And then the more I thought about it, I was like, well, maybe it makes sense to have a title track on there. We tried with two different songs and two quite different sonically sounding songs. Um, so you tried to write a song called Faith in the Future? Yeah, gotcha. yeah. Uh, and, and I tried with actually two different groups of um, writers and, and, and I, I liked both songs. But... What I kind of the conclusion I came to is the statement is so big, it's so large in itself. It was quite hard to kind of capture. I had this vision for what the statement meant to me, um, and that's it's it's kind of a feeling as opposed to for me to be able to explain to you in words. But I just it just never the songs that we had that were the title track just never really spoke to what that phrase meant to me. So, and actually in the end. I actually prefer it now that there isn't a track there that has that name because it kind of it kind of sets the tone for the whole album. It really does. Mm. Something about it. And I'm, now I'm thinking, how many albums, just random, you know, music history? Do do how many albums have a title that don't have a song attached to it? Is that's got to be common-ish, or is it super uncommon? I'd say it must be pretty common. It must be pretty common. I mean, I, I suppose it's like I don't know though. To be honest, I yeah. think a lot of the a lot of these albums I like. Are named after there is a song named after them. So. <laughs> maybe you're starting a new trend, Lou. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. Hey, an- another quick thing I got to ask you about a year ago, true or false? You, I think you posted on Twitter. You leaked the name mm. Faith in the Future. Like you told your fans this in, in cryptically, of course. This was the title, uh, and nobody caught it, or did they? It was it was weird. I had this I had this feeling that I wanted to name the album Faith in the Future, and I was pretty much made up on the idea. And then I just thought, well, let me just try and just tweet it without any context. And again, this is like maybe twelve months ago, nine months ago, whatever it was. Um, and I just felt this like I felt this like want and magnetism to this phrase, like it, like there was even the reaction. Obviously, a lot of people were trying to work out what it meant, but I just it just felt interesting. It felt thought provoking to me. So, like once I kind of put it out like that, I'm not gonna lie. I rinsed it quite a few times. I'd like put it on the end of a couple of posts on my festival I did last year. I had out this message where it was like hidden in the screens. It flashed up for like a second. So I'm not gonna lie. At this stage. If the fans didn't know the album's called Faith in the Future, they yeah. need to have a long, hard looking mirror, I think. <laughs> Dude, it's got, you're putting out these crypt, like James Bond kind of messages. <laughs> oh my. Louis, you came into the studio or the, the radio station here, I don't know, maybe like uh, three, four, whatever months ago. And you played, you played me and a few other people some tracks, mm-hmm. I think four or five tracks from Faith in the Future. But before you came in, you said, you said hi. We had a nice laugh and a chat and whatnot. And then before we go to hear the music, you walk down the room. And I, and I started to read into that, like, because I know I'm going to talk to you and, you know, I've known you for a little bit, but, but I started to think, well, what's, okay, what's he doing? So are, is there a question here? Are you, do you hate to sit or do you, is it awkward to sit in a room while people are listening to your music? And I guess in a sense, kind of judging it, you know, is that a weird moment? Yeah. I mean, two reasons why I did that. I've done a couple of like those like listening parties with fans over the last couple of weeks and I did the same thing there. Um, 
which start, I just feel like a bit of a d- <laughs> just sat there kind of like <laughs> nodding my head to my own tunes that I'm <laughs> so proud of. Um, but you you know what? I, I, of course I, I am. You to like them, of yeah. course I'd like them. Of course I'm proud. But and, and the second reason is I don't like, I don't like, I want people to have their own opinion. I don't, because that's another thing. If some, if I play you my song and I'm sat in the room, you're not going to say it's shit if it is. Do you know what I mean? Fair or point. you're not going to give an honest opinion. So for me, like, it would just, it feel dead eggy. I mean, I'm sure some people do it, so no offence to them, like, but it would just feel dead eggy just being in the room, kind of bopping my head, and I could just feel eyes on me, like, no, no. That's, that's so, I, I've done a couple, you mentioned the listening parties. I did a listening party with Bruno. Uh, like two albums ago, mm-hmm. in a listening party with Lizzo, the the most recent album, and we are sitting there, kind of like, just like you said, kind of bobbing your head, like, <laughs> what what do you do? Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. Louis, uh, tour talk. Give me. I know you got this massive tour planned. I don't think all the details are set in stone yet, but talk about this tour and the excitement of you back on the road. Yeah, well, it's a funny feeling because I I only finished the last tour. I'd say like maybe a month ago, six weeks ago. All the days are blurring into one at the moment. Um. But that was amazing. I'd, I'd wait. I waited for such a long time for that. Um, so that 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 was amazing. And I actually said, maybe two or three weeks into that tour, I turned to my drummer, who's also my musical director, and I said, "Let's make sure we all really take this in because I'm not sure the second tour is going to feel like this." And the reason I said that is because I waited for it for so long. We all waited for it for so long through COVID. And it just felt so perfect that I thought it, it, it can't be like this again. But where we left it, like I said, about four weeks ago, I'm just so excited to get back out on the road. And I was wrong. It is it is going to be as good, if not better. I feel closer to my band than I ever have in terms of chemistry on stage and off stage. I've got a great, great group of people. The fans, every single show, no matter where I'm at, I'm so blessed give an amazing um, energy and, and atmosphere. So the idea of all of those things, but with a new album, sounds pretty perfect to me. Is there anything more perfect than standing on stage in front of your fans specifically and just that rush of, call it energy, call it love? I can't imagine many things compete with that. No, I mean, I'd say nothing. I mean, especially that's why I, that's why I longed for it for so long. You know, it's, it's been before this tour that I had this year, I think it was maybe like something crazy, like six years since I've been on tour. Um, and you get, you know, when you do the occasional performance, you may be a four song thing, you get a vibe of it. But there's something incredibly special about, you know, those tour shows where everyone's in the room with the same intention of just having a great night and the same shared interest of, you know, live music. That's an amazing feeling. And, and, at the end of this, um, at the end of the set of, of this tour I've just finished, I play Kill My Mind. And every single time I get down in the pit, and that is like whatever feeling I get when I first walk out on stage in the first song, it's like, and then towards the end of the set when I get down in the pit, it's like that same feeling just times 10. Like, and that's why I do it every night because you just you can't get enough of that energy and that that kind of feedback that you feel when you're in that live space. I can imagine. Well, look out for tour dates and all this good stuff. And I'm going to when you hit LA, Louis, I will be I'm going to be there. Yeah, well, don't miss this one cuz you gonna, missed the last one, mate. I did. I did. I was yeah. I, yeah, true go story. on, make an excuse, go on. I was leaving Disneyland. Yeah. And uh that's when your tour was I'm a, I'm a terrible Disneyland. person. Disneyland. No, that's okay. You know, you yeah, were, yeah, well, you were kids. I'll let you off then. I'll let you off. <laughs> uh speaking of touring and all that good stuff, uh, do you use? Don't say the don't get, don't give me the answer. But do you have a hotel alias when on tour? Yeah, we have got to, got to, because like especially like earlier in the One Direction days, like I'm pretty sure we always had one, but still, like people would find out what they were. That was my other question. Get, they, how do they find out? That I don't know. I mean, like it, we we were probably dumb enough when we were younger to end up telling fans <laughs> like, and not realize the the necessity of not, but like. Um, well, no, no, never anything too bad happened. Just they just ring the phone like nonstop, or like you know you'd have to answer the door. There'd be one of them knocking at door, and you're just in your boxes. They're buzzing. But oh man, like, and there you're all over Instagram with exactly, your boxes. Exactly. Exactly. Do you have an old? You know, don't give the current, obviously. But do you have an old hotel alias that you can reveal? I'm not honestly. I've got a, I've got a fucking terrible, terrible memory, <laughs> and uh, 
I should be able to remember one, but I feel like the one I've got right now, I feel like I've had the whole time. I can't have done, though. I can't have done. All right. Uh, but I think maybe I did use this one when I was in One Direction as well, so it's lasted this long. Hey, final, I'm obsessed with this for some reason. The final question on these hotel aliases. Uh, the, here's the, the, the upside is privacy. Mm-hmm. The downside is, if let's say you lock your keys in the room and you have to walk downstairs in your boxers, which you probably have a manager do, but nonetheless, in theory... You'd have to walk downstairs and say, hey, I'm, you know, I need to get my keys. I'm Louis Thompson. You know, I'm sorry, there's no Louis Thompson on the list here. I'm sorry, I'm Spider-Man. Have you ever had to, you know? That shit does happen, actually, <laughs> yeah. Um, like, obviously, sometimes if, like, they recognize you, like, it's all right. They understand why you've got, like, the pseudonym or whatever. But, like, sometimes I'll go down in that kind of situation. There's other things, I can't think off the top of my head, but there's other things that we also use, like, those fake names for. Um and then they will kind of proceed to say, well, can you prove that that's you? Now, I'm not going to reveal what it is, but my pseudonym is very evidently not a real name. <laughs> but still, they'll ask me if I've got ID to kind of show for it. I'm like, well, no, obviously not. Louis, bigger than me. First heard this song when you, you, know, you stopped into the, you know, our little meeting here and you played these tracks for us. And man, this song just is one of those jaw-dropping kind of songs. Uh, your voice is just powerful. I can hear it ringing through a stadium. Mm. It just has that feel to it. Talk about Bigger Than Me and even touch on the video if you want. I mean, just uh, yeah, all um, that. The, 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 I didn't have another song like Bigger Than Me on um, Walls. And like with that, I mean that real, real ambitious kind of first look that's got that big soaring chorus. It gives me a moment to shine vocally. Um, and I think, it was important for me to show my growth from album one and two. And that's why I think Bigger Than Me works perfectly in that context because I think it, 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 it sums me up really well as an artist. It's a good advert for, for the album. Um, and, and it feels hopeful. It feels, it feels happy and hopeful as opposed to like weighty and emotional like some of the first. And you mentioned like the, fan, the fans are making this, uh, I forget how you phrased it to me, but the fans are making this bigger than you. It's in, that's kind of the whole point of it, right? They've taken this... Uh, a movement, this Louis movement, if you want to call it, and it's now it is, it's becoming this thing. Yeah, I, I kind of, I got that feeling. I only got to play two shows before COVID, and then COVID hit, and then I finished the the, the rest of the tour. But when I had, that's where the kind of concept first came from, from having those first two shows. And I didn't really know what to expect. Obviously, coming out of One Direction and my touring experience with that, I, I knew how different it might feel. Um, but I was overwhelmed with not just what I saw, but also what I felt over those two shows. And I think it it, it, it was a bit of a process for me to kind of understand that. Because like, I never want to come across like arrogant or wanky or like any of these things. And because of that, it stopped me from kind of looking at how important, dare I say it, I am, or my songs at least, anyway, to these people in those live moments. And that re- I really had to kind of come to that conclusion and have that epiphany. And that's kind of what the song represents is, you know, this is so much bigger than me now. Right. Um, and, and it just kind of, what I always say about me and the fans, it's, it's us as a collective. And that's kind of, it's capturing that whole idea, really. And a quick note on the video, maybe along the same lines, uh, the video, you're building a fire. Mm. So I assume that fire is just basically the, the I don't know. But what? It, yeah, I don't. I know you want your fans to have suppose, their, their own experience. I suppose it's like the th- yeah, The bottom line is, right? I, I've said. Maybe it's just a fire. I've said all. I've said all <laughs> week. I'm like, you know, I leave it open to interpretation, which I will. But it's another thing, right? We, it's a big sounding song, so you need a, a nice looking location. So Iceland was absolutely perfect. Now, what you can't do is just walk around Iceland and sing the song, unfortunately. So there's obviously, there's got to be like a little bit of a narrative in there. So I'm building a fire. Maybe that represents growth. I don't know. Each to their own on any of that. Fair enough. Or maybe, like I said, maybe it's just a fire. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe it is. Exactly. <laughs> Open to interpretation, there we you go. see. Uh, Louis, two-part question. What do you consider your best performance ever? Your entire life, I mean, everything was just about perfect. The complete flip of that. What do you consider your worst? Everything went just straight to hell. <laughs> it's funny how the brain works because, like, straight away, my brain's like, right, that's the worst one. <laughs> so I'll come to that in a second. The best one, I mean, I will say, <clears throat> on those shows where you feel like, you know, everything's kind of going right for you, they can, they can kind of happen at, like, the strangest times. It's not as if you're necessarily prepared for it. 
I mean, there's definitely times where I could think in my head of experiences that I had with One Direction that were like amazing, you know, places to play, amazing shows to play. But in terms of everything going right, um, I tell I tell you what, I tell you what. I mean, the the most recent one was probably when my son Freddie came to watch me in LA oh. at this um at this last tour just gone. So that was about I want to say maybe five months ago. That's the show I missed when I was at Disneyland. Exactly. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. You could you could have met me son. But anyway, <laughs> um, sorry about that. Um, and and no, it was that was it was magical, obviously, because Freddie was there and and I could see him and it made me dead emotional. And maybe because of that, it just everything was great. Now, uh, how do I segue from that to this? The greatest um, moment ever to... Yeah, um, right. So the worst moment, I've never... This is a good one for you, this. I've never actually spoke about this. Um, we were in... It was somewhere on the One Direction tour. I want to say it was in South Africa. Okay. At this part of the tour... Bear in mind, I was about six six years younger than I am now, seven years younger. I'd had a 100% hit rate in terms of going out on the nights that we were going out. That night, let me give you a bit of history. So the first time I had a drink before a show in One Direction, I can remember thinking to myself, this is what it feels like to be a rock star, but I'm in a pop band. Right, right okay. So every kind of show that goes on, you're drinking a little bit more, you're kind of testing your limits, you're like, right, where can I kind of end up? Bear in mind, obviously, I've got to be respectful of the fan base and the parents and all these things that you have to deal with being a young role model or whatever they called us. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm drinking more and more and it never got too excessive except for this one day. And I was drinking vodka Red Bull, always my drink of choice. But where this show was different was I was drinking on stage and I didn't used to do that in the band. So like I'd had all the drink before. I was constantly getting my drink topped up. By the end of the show, I don't really remember the show. I don't really remember the night. All I do remember is getting into the car and it's like my body knew. It just released. I just threw up all oh. over myself. Bear in mind that two minutes before I'm, we were playing to a stadium of like 50,000 people. That would not have been a good look. Oh, look at me, I live to fight another day, but I got put to bed that night and missed the night out. Lessons learned, right? Yes, definitely worse performance, definitely. Louis, uh, I want you to translate these two uh, statements you made. I hope I say them right. Uh, this is the most sonically, speaking of uh, faith in the future, obviously, this is the most sonically ambitious project you've ever done. It's kind of is what it is, but kind of walk me through that. You can give me a little on that. Yeah, I think um, on my first, what, what I mean by that, or let me use an example of what I'm talking about is there's a couple of songs on Faith in the Future that have, that are like more dancey kind of songs. Now, the reason I didn't have anything like that on the first record because I is, was because I had such a point to prove after making the Steve Aoki song as my first single and the BB song, I really wanted to show who I wanted to be. And actually, to a degree, I was close-minded there. Um, so there was this album that I listened to over lockdown or just before lockdown, a band called Australian band called DMAs, and they actually use a lot of kind of dancey elements. Stuart Price produced it. And they do it in a really authentic way, and I thought it was really interesting. I think where this album differs, or what I'm talking about when I said it's more sonically ambitious, it basically just translates to I'm less close-minded on this record. Gotcha. Um, I was so particular and there was so much room for overthinking on that first album that this this second record, I think it just has a more, um, just has a broader range of sounds used on there, basically. You said the phrase, over, I overthink a lot of things too. Uh, and I usually, when I'm talking about overthinking, it's usually negative. Is there a value to our, I'll put me in the loop, is there a value to us overthinking things? Or is it all just a big old mess? I'd, in the context of creation, I suppose they're, they're, they're being meticulous and being and overthinking probably are two kind of similar things. The other thing with overthinking is, and especially in terms of like creating, is you can just overthink forever. So at some point, you've yeah. kind of got to go, well, you know, it is what it is. Fair enough. And another quick note on uh, the album, a statement you made, finding your artistic identity is an ever-evolving process. Uh, give me a little translation on that. 
well, who you are as an artist is, you know, is a reflection of who you are as a person. It's a reflection of the taste that you have musically. And all of those things are constantly evolving. You know, I'm a different person to who I was 10 years ago, and my music taste is slightly evolved as well. So I think as an artist, you are constantly evolving. You learn so much from every song that you write, from every songwriter you write with. So it is, it's a, it's a constant moving puzzle. Louis, uh, you know what? You know this about me. I am obsessed with the paranormal, ghost, <laughs> UFOs, everything in between. I've got a podcast called Paranormalish. I am off the deep, deep end of things when it comes to this stuff. Uh, you have, have you had a paranormal encounter or no? I, I haven't. Um, I haven't. I did used to, I did add a couple of, I want to say a couple of years, might have only been a year where I had like that sleep paralysis thing. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I wouldn't put that down to paranormal. I would put that down to probably at the time being a little bit sleep deprived. Did you uh, see like did you, like some people when they have the sleep paralysis? Did they did you see like the the hag or you know the, some lady some being come at you? Didn't see no weird old lady, <laughs> but I did feel like the weight of something on my chest. Now I think that was probably because I think in sleep paralysis you're you're you're, you're awake but you can't move. So like that was right. kind of the feeling of that. Um, but yeah, no weird old ladies yet. I'll let you know though. Fair, fair enough. A final final question when it comes to this big tour coming up. Obviously, you know you haven't set all the dates yet. I don't think. But uh, now maybe now is the perfect time to talk about this. One of these hotels, nice hotels. Mm. A lot of them have a lot of them. I bet a history. You know, especially the older ones. Mm. And there's always that room. Oh man, don't don't stay in that room. And Winston Churchill once stayed here, and his ghost, or you know, the ghost of someone. Would you be open to staying in one of the haunted rooms and reporting back on what you may or may not see? Definitely. I'm the type of guy that, because it, it, it'll happen like, you know, one in five hotels, that the, <laughs> the, the, the man or woman who's checking you in, they'll tell you the story about some random room that's haunted or whatever. Now, I'm a little bit cynical about it. So because of that, I'm like, right, well, just put me in that room and I'll let you know. I'll do a Ouija board and find out. Okay, you're the guy then. Uh, whenever you, Whenever this happens... Just make mental notes, yeah, and you know, bank them for me. When next time we chat, you know, hey, Jojo, room twenty-two, whatever. That didn't tell me the whole story. Is there a special word that I need to speak out to make sure the ghost chat to me? Or uh, I, you know, what? There, I don't think I, if if I find that out, I'll let you know okay, too. Okay, okay. Right. Finally, somebody, everybody tells me no on that. Yes, yeah, I'm in, man, I'm in. Of course, bigger than me. This track is amazing. I mean, I'm, just, I'm in love with everything you've done on this thing, Louis. Faith in the future coming out November the 11th. Even more important to me, well, not more important, but uh, that we we have to discuss this tattoo. Mm. More I, important to you, that sums you up, Jojo, doesn't it? To be fair, I just need to. I feel we've talked about this off air. <laughs> You're right, uh, but I, I feel like I need to have this conversation on air, mm. for, so the fans know the, the full story. You, uh, I made a deal with you. How I made this deal, I don't know, but it was a deal. It was correct. A deal. <laughs> it was a deal that we don't go back on. Continue, <laughs> continue. Uh, and, uh, you got to pick my tattoo, mm-hmm. and it went on my body yep. before I knew what it was. And I and I would do it again. It was one of my favorite days of work. It yeah, was so it great. It was good. Um, and the, the the tattoo you chose to give me was a poop emoji that says happens underneath it. Mm. And uh, of course, I look up after we're, we're done. The poop emoji on my on my chest, sort of. Um, and then after the fact, uh, you take the the tattoo artist did your design. Then you take the tattoo gun needle and with your own hand and put LT on my skin. Which, for the record, that's the most important part, right? Not to me. Oh, not to me. Don't, no. Okay. Well, no. anyway. Well, <laughs> anyway. I'm asking for forgiveness and uh, because I, my wife saw the poop and, and uh, you know, so she sees this. <laughs> She's like, yeah, you, you, you're, you're going to keep that? I'm like, well, I guess, I guess so. She goes, you got to take, just take the poop off. I'm like, all right. So I ended up getting a tattoo on my chest of uh, Michael Jackson, Mickey Mouse doing the smooth criminal thing. That's, you know, and the reason I say that is that there's a, a spotlight shining on Mickey. On my chest, and the spotlight now covers up just the poop part of it. Okay. So I can okay. keep my marriage. Uh, but but I went out of the way to make sure that the LT that you signed on my skin is it's still there. Yeah, I like that. So, I, I liked the, the steaming turd a bit better. But... <laughs> I'm sure you did. So, okay, I, I, uh, please forgive me for taking off the poop, but I, please I think love I the LT. You. All right. Now, uh, w- when it comes to tattoos now, yep. here we go with our tattoo relationship. Part two, the album title, Faith in the Future. Mm. I, and I think you as well, if it's, unless you've changed your mind, uh, I would love to do a tattoo session where we both get the album title. A, I love you. I love the album. I love what the title means. And B, uh, I think it'd just be kind of fun to do. 
It would definitely be fun. Are you open to getting the tattoo but spelt wrong? No. Okay. Okay. Why <laughs> okay. would well, okay. you want me to do that? I don't know. I don't know. Just to replace the Stephen Turd. I mean, <laughs> I feel like I'm owed something out of the tattoo game. Well, what would the misspelled word be? No, I mean, like, just, I don't know, maybe like future, rant- just spell future wrong, F-T-U- faith in the future, right? Me. Just, just something that's, like, mildly embarrassing for you. That was the point from the steaming turd, not not the LT, which is lovely, <laughs> that's lovely. Um, can, can I think that over the faith? Well, but hey- it did make me proud when when you, you basically said how disgusted your wife was of the tattoo. <laughs> that, that meant that the prank And worked. for the record, she, she loves you, and she thinks the world of you. She's a fan. Nice. But she's not a fan of the turd. <laughs> All right, enough. so, uh, okay, if I get the misspelled faith in the future, are you getting the misspelled faith in no, the future? No, we'll get the we'll get the proper one. We'll oh get the proper God. one. But you uh, can get a no, I was gonna say you can get a little turd next to it, but that's basically saying that the album <laughs> is so <laughs> can't do that. Louis, your fans love you. I mean it's just I mean the media the the the, the lights shine bright on you wherever you go. Um you've never but you've never you've chosen to never use a disguise. We couple were talking of, about this a couple moment. of things on that, right? Yeah. First it must be mortifying when you get caught <laughs> like so someone spots you and you have to pull off your fake mustache or whatever it is like that must be soul destroying that could not be me but also in my experience although it's not a specific disguise it just it doesn't really work so for example i've got tattoos right. so like you'd have to cover up your tattoos your arms maybe even my hands but why well, I, I remember quite a few times or especially the first time that i went skiing now, when you go skiing in in France, it's it's freezing. So you're not you know what I mean. You're fully fully covered. The only bit that's out really are, are your eyes. I'm thinking about getting in between like ski lifts and stuff. Um, and still, people will still ask for photos. How they know, I don't know. But will I be done in a, a disguise anytime soon? I doubt that. I doubt how, that. Okay. Uh, how how do they know? I mean, you. That's a good. Uh, this is a good example of maybe why disguises don't work. I mean, you're head to toe, you're covered. I mean, unless they just knew that you were there and they... I suppose it's who I'm with, you know, it's who I'm with. But they with were covered that... up too, right? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, they will have been, of course. So yeah. All they see are your eyes. Yeah. And that's and that gave it away. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Son I can't really, God. yeah, I can't really work out why, but um, yeah. I mean, okay, I'm looking into his eyes. Okay. Yeah. yeah wow. You get it now. Yeah. Mesmerize me. Yeah. Right, there we go. Louis, uh, your your friends, and let's go like way back, old school, like kindergarten. But you know the crew that's been with you the longest, mm. and this is old news to them now. I mean, you are who you are. It's you're established. But what's their reaction to all this success? Their reaction. Very very British actually. <laughs> what, is, um, what does that mean? <laughs> I, d- Sarcastic. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that they don't care less because that wouldn't be fair to him, but. They're not that bothered. I mean, look, like, like in the nicest way. And actually, I love that. Love that. Um, they just, they just, you know, it's not as if we ever really kind of share moments like that. On the rare occasion, maybe once a year from one of me, like, dead close mates, they'll give me a little pat on back and say, well done. But it's not really, it's not really the way we are. We're always just ripping into each other. So it's not really, there's no room for anything like that. And also, I know, I know that, or at least I hope that they're proud of me and what I've, achieved and even in my solo career but we don't ever, ever really talk about it you just let's go have a drink let's yeah, go chill yeah yeah um same same question to you what is your reaction to all the success i mean and and you know it, more importantly the solo success so far i've, I've been mind blown i've been mind blown. I, di- I didn't know i had absolutely no idea what to expect um you know i can remember going out on my solo career for the first that first when I first made the decision that I wanted to do that, you're trying to work out where you stand in the industry. And with that, you're kind of looking like in the past of like other examples of other people who've come out of bands and how do you draw up against that? And it's just, it's a never ending, um, mysterious equation in your head. (laughs) So like for me, like I, the point I'm making is I had absolutely no idea what to expect. I was blessed in my experience in one direction, but, Every single time I've had my own success, be it this tour, hopefully this next album, it just constantly surprises me, constantly surprises me. So I just feel blessed, man. A quick recap, Bigger Than Me, uh, the first single off the album is out. Uh, Get into it, of course. Uh, Faith in the Future, the album's coming out November the 11th. Oh my God, can't wait. I think I'm speaking for all your fans. I've only heard a couple of tracks. 
And if that's any indication of where we're going with this album, I mean, good God, Louis. I t- I t- I just quickly on that, I'll tell you where, actually, yeah. Throughout all these uh, listening parties I've had, they've not listened to the same songs as you have. Oh, really? Yeah, so you have had, a, you've got a proper scoop there. Yes, like sir. Chicago, for example, like no one's heard that. Yeah, some, okay, I was, uh, I was we, we do a thing called First Listen Friday on the iHeartRadio Twitter. And I was trying my best to describe Chicago without giving anything that I thought might be top secret away. And I made the dumbest statement. I'm like, I said, uh, and your fans are like, Jojo, what the heck? I said, Chicago is not about the city. It's about some people. And, of course, they were like, well, of course it's not about. I'm like, but I think that's a fair, it's fair to say that it's not about Chicago, right? Because there are songs called New York, New York, which is about New York. Yeah, I love L.A. is about L.A. I think that's a fair thing to say, right? Yeah, Maybe I, I'm just I, dumb. No, it is. It is. But, <laughs> but I will say, I, I, I do have a special relationship with Chicago. Like, it's, it is like, I mean, yeah, it is. It's Wait, so cool it's, about, it's about people, but not... It's it also it's about Chicago too. I mean, I do feel this kind of affiliation to to Chicago, but like it's mostly it's half theoretical, all right, imaginative, and half based on real events. Let me put it like that. So I don't feel as dumb. Then okay, now you make me feel better about my statement. Okay, all right. okay, all right. So that you're tour, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the tour coming up soon. Uh, all that good. Stuff. What else? What else do people need to know, Louis? Before we wrap this up, do people need to know? Um, fuck knows what in life uh, uh, about you <laughs> about me um, <laughs> words of wisdom to know I mean in terms of what I want people to get out of this record let me just speak specifically about my fans I hope that the first time my fans listen to the album top to bottom that they are left with a feeling of excitement of what the next tour is going to sound and feel like. Because the this last tour has been amazing. But we didn't have a load of tempo to choose from. The 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 idea of what the next tour looks and sounds like in my head feels like a more exciting prospect. So hopefully they're just excited about what's to come. Good to see you, Louis. Good to see you, lad. At the end of every interview, fist bump to make it official. Give me a little bye yeah.